This is a video of my healthy four-year-old Vishla Monty in 2021. And when he woke up that morning doing this, I knew something was wrong. Hey, boy. And if you can't tell it by my voice, I was terrified. And what I didn't know is that we would lose him to an acute neuromuscular disease in just five days. This is a picture of me FaceTiming him from the operating room when my husband was transferring him from our local veterinary hospital to the University of Georgia. We didn't have the diagnosis. And he died that night. And I never got a chance to say goodbye. Several days after he died, the test results came back and he suffered from acute fulminating myasthenia gravis. This is a disease that can happen in dogs and in humans. Myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune neuromuscular disease in which your muscles just give out on you. So I'm going to break down what the disease is, how we diagnose it, and how we treat it. Yesterday, I talked about the case of a 32-year-old woman who came to her primary care doctor because she was just feeling tired at the end of the day, and she felt like her eyes were drooping and she was having double vision and even trouble speaking. Women are three times more likely to be diagnosed with this disease than men. The most common age of onset is between ages 20 and 39. Most common presenting symptoms are ptosis or drooping of the eyelid, blurry vision, changes in facial expression, difficulty speaking, chewing, and even breathing. So here's the science of how this disease occurs. It's an autoimmune disease, so your body's immune system begins to attack itself. And in this disease, it attacks the acetylcholine receptors at the neuromuscular junction. What does that even mean? Neuromuscular junction is where the signals between your brain and your muscles fire. So if they can't communicate, your muscles don't get the message. It's like calling 911 and nobody picks up. So even though your muscles aren't working, it's not a muscular problem. It's a communication problem. Like in all autoimmune disorders, your body's own defense mechanism is turning on itself. And the most common antibody produced in this disease is an anti-acetylcholine receptor antibody. For some reason, your body's immune system produces this and it begins to attack your own acetylcholine receptors. And those receptors are on muscles that are receiving the communication signals. So if they get attacked, they don't work anymore. In other cases of myasthenia, their body will produce an anti-MUSK antibody. And that's targeting muscle-specific kinase. And that's another protein on the surface of the neuromuscular junction. Either way, the end result is the same. Progressive muscle weakness with use. Well, myasthenia often starts in the eyes with ptosis or drooping of the eyelids, as well as blurry vision. Those muscles that control the eye movements and the eyelid elevation are controlled by cranial nerve number three. And the eye and eyelid muscles have a predominantly higher concentration of acetylcholine receptors than other muscles in our body. And since we're always using our eye muscles, they often show the initial symptoms. The weakness demonstrated in myasthenia gravis is fluctuant. It means it worsens with activity and improves with rest. And this fluctuating weakness is the hallmark of the disease. Well, yesterday I mentioned something called the ice pack test. That's when you apply an ice pack to the eyelid for just a few minutes and to see if the ptosis improves. And if it does, that's a positive result suggesting myasthenia. Why would ice improve the symptoms? Cooling the muscles, particularly the eyelid muscles, can help improve acetylcholine transmission. You see, cold inhibits something called acetylcholine esterase. Something that breaks down acetylcholine, so applying the ice pack can temporarily increase the amount of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction and make the eye function improve. Obviously, it's not a definitive test, but it can help. Another older test that we used to use is something called the Tensilon test, where we would administer a short-acting acetylcholine esterase inhibitor and see if the patient gets any improvement. However, today there are much better and accurate tests that we can perform, such as blood testing for these antibodies that I mentioned earlier. Also, single fiber EMGs can be utilized. And yesterday I also mentioned this CT scan to check the thymus. What's the thymus? It's a gland in your upper chest behind your breastbone, and it plays a crucial role in the immune system, particularly in the development and maturation of T cells. In myasthenia, it's often implicated in the disease's development and progression because it's the site where the autoimmune response initiates. Many individuals with myasthenia will have hyperplastic thymus. 
meaning that it's larger than normal because it's making more B and T cells want to get a scan to rule out something called a thymoma, which is actually a tumor in a small subset of myasthenia gravis patients. And in some cases, removing the thymus could be a treatment for the disease and could even lead to remission. Well, what are the other treatments? It's usually a multi-layered approach because we're fighting the body's own immune system. Sometimes we'll use acetylcholinesterase inhibitors like a drug called peridostigmine that helps get more acetylcholine in the neuromuscular junction. Sometimes we'll use immunosuppressive medicines to help reduce the way our body's immune system is responding. And those may be medications like steroids and several other immunosuppressive meds. In acute myosinic crisis, we'll go big and do treatments like IVIG or plasmapheresis. Plasmapheresis is when you actually filter out those antibodies from the patient's own blood. You literally pull that patient's plasma out, pull out those antibodies, and then give it back to them. And that's actually the treatment that they had recommended for Monty, who was actually scheduled to start that the following day, but he just didn't make it. Myasthenic crisis is a life-threatening worsening of myasthenia gravis symptoms. It can be triggered by something as simple as a respiratory infection. Other potential causes of crisis include surgery, stress, and pregnancy. And 30 to 40% of cases do not have an identifiable trigger. The prognosis for patients with myasthenia gravis is generally positive, with most individuals experiencing improvement with treatment and a near normal life expectancy. And the key teaching point here to make the diagnosis is that fluctuating weakness. Remember, it often affects those ocular, bulbar, and proximal muscles. In our patient's case, she was diagnosed promptly, started on treatment, and has really gotten almost back to normal at this point. June is Myasthenia Gravis Awareness Month, so it's important to educate about the symptoms, promote understanding of the disease, and support for those individuals and families that are affected by it, and advocate for continued research and advancements in treatment. Another case of patient-focused and compassionate care Stay tuned next week, and I'll go through another case.